Hi, how are you? My name is Gina Hadley, and I'm a co-founder of a company called The Second Shift. And I am so happy that we are going after Emily so we don't have to talk about what's wrong with culture and companies. We can just dig into how culture can be a tool for retention. And I have an incredible panel with me, Troy Fenner, who is the Senior VP of Human Resources for Roku. Pat Waters, who is the Chief Ta Talent Officer, pardon me, at ServiceNow and Susan Robinson, who is partner for culture and inclusiveness at EY. So we're just gonna jump right in. And one of the things that we all talk, we talked about when we had our calls is, culture is a very big word. What does it mean? What does culture mean, Pat, at ServiceNow? Culture is essentially what every employee experiences every day when they go to work. All those mini experiences create your culture. Susan, for you. Yeah, so my view on it would be exactly the same. And we get a, a, a lucky perspective of, of looking at our own culture. And we're you know, a global firm of just under 300,000 employees. So that's a whole other story in there in terms of culture. But even the clients that we get to work with. So really getting a sense of uh, how varied culture can be as well. And so it's a very topical thing for technology as well, which we'll, we'll dive into a bit more. Troy. Right. Um, so we think of culture um, like DNA. You know, how do we talk with each other? How do we make decisions? How do we interact with each other? Um, obviously, it's it, it's more than a, a slogan or a T-shirt or a poster that we throw up in walls and conference rooms. But it's it's truly how do we how do we launch products? How do we hire people? How do we treat people? How do we decisions get made? That's how we consider we, we think about culture at Roku. One of the things that, Susan, you brought up is you are a global, worldwide company with a huge employee base. How do you disseminate this culture message, especially across different regions? Yeah, so I have a bit of a bias because I've been a partner for a while at the firm and have great respect for the culture that's been cultivated there. And I think, you know, I also get to play in the culture space with clients. And if I can be objective uh, credibly with EY, I actually think we have a very, very strong uh, organizational culture, particularly for a consulting firm and an audit firm. Um, and, you know, we are heavily matrixed. Um, and uh, on the one hand, that allows us to have a great variability in our reach in terms of how uh, who manages people, who's on different teams, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but that could go sideways as well as a result of being so heavily matrixed. And I, I give the firm a lot of credit for being very deliberate and careful in um, setting the tone around um, you know, key things, very much like we're talking about today around, around inclusivity um, and uh, you know, the balance of um, diversity in our organization. We're not perfect um, by any means, but there is very, very strong uh, strategic intent on uh, how our culture is uh, defined, managed, measured, um, and it shows up in terms of you know what our what our experience is. And, and the last thing I'll say, and I'll stop after that, is um, millennials. We have at least seventy percent of our workforce are millennials, um, and you know we have. I believe we are obliged to figure out how do you make that culture as uh, inclusive as possible, so that you can you know harness as much of that energy and innovation uh, and talent as as possible. Um, and when, it, when we had spoken, the one thing I wanted to make sure that we got to is the word belonging, right. which is part of the EY culture. And how does that manifest itself across the company? You, you guys have some great tools that you use. Yeah, there's some very interesting um, efforts, particularly recently, around um, the theme of belonging in our workforce. And you know, look, culture is very varied. Also, because we're global, you want to respect national cultures as well, and that's all part of the fabric. Um, and what we've launched recently are a few videos with the title of belonging. And one of them focuses on, uh, I think it's a, a manager who uh, is a new father. And he's, we've extended our paternity leave benefits so he's able to spend some more time with his young daughter and his family. And the whole story is about being enabled to do that helps him be a better person at work. You know, so it's taking a broader view of you know, real life things that hit us and how does that show up in terms of how we allow people or enable people to, to find some balance. Um, and the second one that we've released is about um, a young senior consultant who uh, is multiracial. And she tells her story very personally around you know, never feeling uh, black enough, never feeling Latino enough for different communities, and just her own personal experience and then what that's felt like for her as she's 
you know, settled into the firm. And it's really, it's authentic. I think that's one thing that's very important about it. Um, and it's, it's relatable. Um, and it's so important to, to make sure that we are telling those stories more and more. Um, because, you know, we're, kids are watching that stuff. We're watching that stuff. And it's influencing yeah. how we treat everybody. Um, one of the things that we had, we had said we wanted to get out of this panel was to be able to um, examples of deployable tools. And one of the things, Troy, that we had talked about is the way that you at Roku and, your, and the senior um, teams come up with policy and your policy documents, which I thought was an amazing way of getting um, some collaboration involved. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that um, at Roku that we really value is, is as part of our culture is transparency and collaboration. That's really um, the essence of how we get things done. And typical when you're a lot of times where there are companies and you're writing policies or culture docs, it seems like it's you know a group of HR people and then you roll it through the senior leadership team and then one day it, it shows up on all the cafeteria tables. And that's, that's not what, how we do it at Roku. One of the things that we use, we use a lot of Slack and Confluence are two tools that we use. Confluence is a great collaboration tool. Um, it really was driven through engineering of how they could collaborate on projects. And one of the things that we do that, um, you know, most recently, um, Anthony Wood, our CEO, and um, the senior leadership team we were working on, we have culture docs of what we think the culture is at Roku. But there's a special one that um, we've written of what we think a VP should be at Roku. And we started working on that document, and Anthony quickly posted that onto Confluence uh, so the whole entire company can see uh, what are the qualities, what are the competencies, what do we think make a great leader? One, to help people, because everyone always probably comes to the HR people and go, I want to be a VP someday. And I'm like, why? Um, <laughs> and, um, it, but it's a great tool where um, everybody in the company was allowed to contribute and comment. And it forced a lot of dialogue going back and forth between, you know, just I wasn't coming off the, the mountains with 10 commandments. It yeah. was a much more collaborative process and people understood and we understood and learned too what people were looking for out of leadership in that process. And one of the things that we, you had said to me also is that collaboration does not necessarily mean consensus, but that's okay. Absolutely, I mean, um, the HR guy here would love to tell you that consensus happens all the time and it's rarely <laughs> achieved. Uh, we're all super smart, we have different ideas, um, and you don't have to agree, but when people feel like there's collaboration, that, it, that um, one, it, it definitely helps them from a buy-in standpoint, but really reinforces the trust part of your culture that everyone has a voice and um, we listen to that. And going back to this, the, the idea that culture is this day-to-day -day experience that employees have at the company, Pat, when we spoke, you, you talked to me about the three legs of the value proposition for employees that I thought was so pragmatic and something that we should share with everybody here. So essentially when you're thinking about creating an amazing employee experience, when you're trying to create that culture of belonging where people can be their authentic self, they know that you care about them, that they matter, and uh, they can do their best work in your company. What you need to think about that employee experience is basically three components. Think of the top component being culture. It's your employee value propositions, your policies, your practices, is how you aspire to treat your employees, management training, et cetera. The second leg of that stool are your systems and tools. It's the tools that you give your employees to manifest their work, to get insights, to help them be a better them help facilitate training, et cetera, and capture the, the insights that you need to run your business. And that third element is the work environment in which they work. And that work environment is both the digital workspace as well as the physical, because there's so many remote workers. We are global. And how do you pull in both the system, the technology, but to create a virtual experience that feels like I am part of this company, that you're hearing my voice, that I can speak of? And all three of you had mentioned how important it was to, to also disseminate your culture story with your customers as well. Um, Troy, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the what we talked about in terms sure. of when outside culture and what's going on in the mainstream is at odds sometimes with your company mission. Yeah, I mean, um, one thing about Roku um, has, uh, we have a, a great amount of content on our platform and it's one of the things that we're, we're very proud of, of being able to give our customers the ability to watch what they wanna watch, when they wanna watch it at their economic terms. And so we have over 5,000 channels on our platform. And some of those channels, um, we, we always take a very neutral stance on there. But there's an NRA channel, there's progressive channels, there's all sorts of different views on there. And we will have people, um, you know, 
come and like return their Roku boxes or they'll send me the nasty letter or anybody they'll listen to saying, look, you're profiting off of the NRA or you're profiting off of the Democratic Party or Republic, whoever. And that becomes very controversial where um, people want you to take that channel down um, or they want you, um, or your employees will start sending you emails going, is it true that you're making money off of this content and that, that doesn't fit with my value set? And that's a very challenging thing for a company. Um, anytime you get into content, um, there is this element of censorship and taking channels down. Um, we have set policies for what would, why we would remove a channel, and we do remove channels, um, but we also had this, um, if it's not violating that policy, we're, we're not going to remove that channel, and we don't profit off that channel, but we have to be very clear um, to be, this is our policy, these are our standards, and these are our values of our company. And to sometimes that's not always in line with people's individual um, beliefs, but the only way you get through that as a company by having very strong cultural um, values that are core to your to how you run the company, how do you talk to people, and people will send those emails directly to Anthony and or to myself or to anybody in the company, and we will address it as a whole company of why we believe this. It's very close to modern age book burning, so yeah. we're, we're not going to go down that path. But So even if it's in vogue right now to shut off something that you don't want to hear, if it makes you uncomfortable, yeah, it's the, not, I, I can imagine it happens at everybody. The day values everybody's. and cores become, you know, no longer fashionable, yeah. then, then we've got a lot of big problems in this business. So um, we'll stand by ours. So I think in practice, col company culture many times comes from up high and there's, there's um, missions that are set. How do we, how do, how do stakeholders, because much of the, we, you know, the saying is you don't quit your job, you quit your manager. So how do you disseminate this message down through, through the layers so that, because every once in a while you may hit somebody for whom this is not part of their day-to-day -day mantra and the culture is at odds with what they are told that is part of what, of, what they're supposed to achieve. Pat, if you wanna. So, um, gosh, that's like the magic sauce, right? Right. So, and but you'll solve it. We, we, got we two can minutes. solve it. Um, <laughs> I think it's like set the tone first, and then reinforce that tone along the way every day. I mean, like I said, employees. The culture is how the employees experience you every day, and so how you onboard talent, how you court talent. What was your promise that you offered? Then are you delivering on that promise? Catch yourself if you're if you're not congruent, then you're not gonna be as trusted. Then, then your culture's impacted whether you see it or not. And then manager training, over and over again. I say repeat, rinse, repeat. It's like, these are the values, this is the behaviors, this is what we're accountable for. And if people don't subscribe to those behaviors and those practices, there's gotta be a consequence. Either we train them again, or, or they leave, right? They, mm -hmm. People look up and say, you know, who's leading and how are we leading and how are we gonna maintain that trust? So there's, you just got to thread it throughout your DNA. So do you think that at UI as well, I mean, you have, you have such a diverse and disparate workforce all over the world. Um, do you feel that that's the way that you're approaching this as well? Yeah, I mean, I think culture is, um, it's one of these esoteric topics that everyone generally has a perspective on. We feel it, we live it, we breathe it as we work in our companies or we shift to another organization, whatever the case may be. What, what I think is most interesting about it is that um, there's such an uh, overwhelming amount of organizations that take a passive approach to culture. And I think it needs to be deliberate, as deliberate as your financial plan, as your process and enabling growth plans, you need to also pay close attention to culture. And there are very pragmatic ways in which you can do that. And to your question, I think it's a multi-pronged approach. And I completely agree with everything you said. I think organizational characteristics are a big part of it. What's the infrastructure in the organization to help bolster and you know, tactically manage or support the culture vision? Um, talent strategies are a big part of it. Um, leadership development, and that can be at the top, but also people leaders and so on. And I think metrics are really important. So, you know, figure out what are, you know, the traditional metrics around culture or inclusiveness or diversity or whatever you want to call it. Um, they're good, they do good things, but it's not really moving the needle in a way that it should 
in my opinion. So what's that about? And you know, we spend a lot of time trying to pry that back to understand how do we fix that, continue to fix that for ourselves, um, and how do we then help our clients with that as well? So it, it's uh, it's big and broad and complex, but if you can, you know, boiling the oceans a lot, but if you can <laughs> take a cup every now and then, yeah. you can you can fix it. And it's you know I think it's going to be a differentiator in the market, particularly with all these forces of technology, generational shifts, all that stuff. I think those that pay close attention to their culture um, will be the differentiators in the longer run. I agree. I want to thank you guys so much. I can't believe we're already out of time, but I hope that you um, were able to take something back um, to your organizations because um, these are three big thinkers and I think that you have a lot of pragmatic and I feel very optimistic talking to all three of you, um, which is not the case all the time. So <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, Gina. Thank